All right, welcome back to section 2.1, and now we're going to look at domain. Um, so unless otherwise stated, because sometimes we can like restrict domain, um, the domain of a function is the largest subset of real numbers of x for which f of x is a real number. Essentially, um, what are we able to plug into the function? So we might remember um, with rational functions, right, the denominator can't be 0 because then f of x is undefined. Um, another example is square roots, right? That inside number, which is called the radicand, has to be non-negative, right? Because if I plug in um, a negative, right, f of x is imaginary. So that also is not a real number. So let's just review domain um, with some examples, and I can link some more review from Khan Academy as well if we don't remember this. So domain. So the first one is rational. Rational means the denominator can't be zero. Because um, if I plug in zero in the denominator, the value is undefined. The numerator can be anything. X squared plus nine, I don't care. Um, any number works on top. It's just the denominator can't be zero. So we're going to solve this for when it equals zero, and these will be my restricted values. Um, so let's see. If I factor, I need a product of six and a sum of negative 5, so minus 3 and minus 2, meaning x can't be 3 or 2. So you can write set notation, which looks like this, or you can do interval notation, which gets a little tricky, but it would be negative infinity to 2, 2 to 3, because we're basically saying any number works except for 2 and 3. So negative infinity to 2, 2 to 3, and then 3 to infinity. And by adding those parentheses, it's telling me not 2 or 3. And that's my domain. I don't care which notation you use, either or. Um, how about g of x, the next one? Um, so this is a polynomial. Is there any time polynomials are undefined? Um, right, they make this shape. They go on forever. I think any value of x works, right? There's nothing I can plug in where it wouldn't work. So we can say all real numbers, right? I can plug in absolutely any x or negative infinity to infinity, right? Any number I plug in for x, the function works. But domain is basically we solve for what doesn't work to state what does work. All right, let's do a combination of square roots and fractions. So we have two things going on on this one. We have a square root on top, and we have a denominator. So let's do the denominator first because we've already done one. So the denominator can't be 0 because that would be undefined. So t squared plus 9 can't equal 0. Um, but because that's a, it's not factorable, right? t squared is positive, 9 is positive. Um, we'll review graphing a little later, but it's like a shifted version of a parabola, which means it's never zero. So this has no solutions, so all real numbers are okay. No restricted values. And try it. Plug some numbers in. Nothing will make that zero. Um, so what's the rule for radicands? So 1 minus t is called a radicand. It's inside the square root. And with inside, inside square roots, that has to be 0 or positive. Um, we can take square roots of 0, and we can take square roots of a positive number, but we can't take square roots of a negative number. And then since this is linear, it's, we don't have to worry about any of those weird number line things, so I'll just solve regularly. So we'll add t to both sides. So 1 is greater than or equal to t, or I prefer t is less than or equal to 1. So it looks like this in set notation, right? Or less than or equal to 1 means negative infinity to 1, and then since 1 is included, we use a bracket. Basically anything less than 1 or 1 will work for this function. 
And you can always check by plugging a couple numbers in. So if you plug in two, it won't work, but if you plug in negative five, it will work. Cool, so just a couple more. Uh, this one's a little tricky. This will give us some practice with those weird inequalities as well. Um, since this is a square root, the entire thing inside the square root needs to be greater than or equal to zero. And so since this is nonlinear, we need to use the number line instead with the test intervals. Do not multiply by x plus 2 because we don't know if it's positive or negative. So this is back from our first chapter. So we find those zeros, right? So the top tells me x is 3, right? Those are my zeros, and the bottom would be x equals negative 2. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a number line. All right, so we have negative infinity to negative 2. We have negative 2 to 3. And then we have 3 to infinity. And then this is where it gets tricky. So 3, because we have or equal, 3 is included. Right, 3 is allowed. Um, why is 2 not allowed, negative 2 not allowed? So it's tempting to say we include the endpoint because of the or equal, but because 2 is in the denominator, right, it's not in the domain. So we're going to x out negative 2. Sorry, I keep saying 2. We're going to x out negative 2. So even though endpoints are included, 2, negative 2 cannot be included because it makes the denominator 0. So I'm going to remind you how to do those test intervals. If you feel confident from chapter one, you should go and try this without me. It's good to practice. Um, but let's see. So let's do this interval first. So I'm going to go ahead and pick, I guess, negative three. So three minus negative three would be positive. Negative three plus two would then be negative. And then when I divide, positive over negative is negative. So this would be a negative interval. Let's try the next one. So I like 0. I always pick 0 when I can. 3 minus 0 is positive. 0 plus 2 is positive. And then positive over positive is positive. And then our final interval, I don't know, I'm going to pick 10, why not? You can pick 4, 5, 6, right? You can pick anything bigger than 3. So 3 minus 10 is negative. 10 plus 2 is positive. So negative over positive is negative. So this interval is negative. And so back to the original question, right? We wanted that inner function to be positive so that we can take square roots. So I'm going to go ahead and pick this interval only. And then since we included 3, right, we're going to change these. So our domain would be negative three, 2 to 3 with 3 included. Or right, x is in between negative 2 and 3, where 3 is included. So it's a nice mix of our old um, stuff at the same time. Cool, so just a couple more examples. The last few are quicker. Um, we can find domain and range from graphs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of make a box around the graph as if I'm like zooming in. So domain is my x values. So x goes this way. So it looks like x goes from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So x goes from one to nine with both included. So my domain is 1 to 9 with the endpoints included. Range goes up and down from the lowest point to the highest point. So not endpoints, low to high. So y goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So y goes from 1 to 6, again with the endpoints included. So that's a visual of domain and range, right? Domain is horizontal, range is vertical. This one's a little trickier. We 
we have those asymptotes, right? These are things that it can't equal. So it looks like x can't equal negative 1 or 1 on this graph. These are my asymptotes. So my domain would be negative infinity to negative 1. That's this part. Where negative 1's not included because that's an asymptote. And then we're going to jump to this piece. So this piece is from negative 1 to 1. Oftentimes we forget the middle piece. And then this last piece would be 1 to infinity. Cool. Range is my y value, so up and down this way. Um, so it looks like we have an asymptote that direction as well. Looks like y can't be 0. It looks like it never quite reaches it. So if we go from bottom to top, we're going to go negative infinity to 0. And then it looks like there's this gap in the graph, and it looks like y doesn't start again until 1. So then it goes from 1 to infinity. So that would be my range. It means there are no y values from 0 to 1. You can see that in the graph. So anytime a graph keeps going, right, we assume it's going to infinity. So hope that helps with domain and range, the visual version. Um, one final definition here is the vertical line test. So a graph is a function if and only if every vertical line that intersects it does so at most once. So let's look at these graphs. So if I were to draw a vertical line, does it ever cross it more than once? No, right? Draw them all over, right? No matter where you draw a vertical line, it only shows up once. So yes, and then how about the other one? Yeah, no matter where I draw a vertical line, it only crosses it once. So I'll show you the opposite in a second. Every vertical line crosses at most once. So let's try to think of some examples that are not functions. There's lots of options. So maybe you remember circles from the previous chapter, right? Notice if I draw some of the vertical lines, it crosses twice. Um, what else? Maybe like a sideways parabola, right? If I draw a vertical line, it crosses more than once. Um, there's, right, we could draw some sort of spiral, right? If I draw a line, it crosses lots of times. So really anything where, if I can draw a vertical line that goes through more than once, then it's no longer a function. And so this is really like our brief review of functions. So I hope this helps us remember them. Um, we're gonna jump into graphing coming up. Um, and some symmetry. So I'll see you in the next section.